So for this video, we're going to be talking about buying real estate remotely because who wants to actually look at their property in person? In all seriousness, people, uh, this is not for everybody. Uh, you know, if you're not willing to go ahead with buying something that could be a uh, several hundred thousand dollar purchase and a major investment in your life, it's probably not the best idea. But for me, I buy all of my properties remotely, at least the ones that I rent. Now, this can't be investment or financial advice because it's a YouTube channel where I use a whiteboard and draw stuff like this. So if you do use this for investment advice, I highly advise against it because it's not. Uh, go ahead and see all this cash right here. Uh, go ahead and burn that because um, that's what's going to happen. It's just going to disappear in uh, some smoke out of your new house's chimney. Okay, so buying real estate remotely, what does it do? It helps you expand the areas you can rent in. It helps you get better tenants. It helps you go to areas where you can't travel because of, you know, global uh, sickness problem restrictions. You can't just like fly anywhere sometimes, you know what I'm saying? I uh, can't say uh, that uh, whole, uh, the P word with the C, um, you know, that'll get me demonetized. Not that I'm monetized anyway. Uh, maybe I will be in the future, but uh, you'd have to actually click that subscribe and the bell and the thumb thing there uh, in order for me to get there. So uh, don't worry about that because we're just talking about uh, buying some stuff. Okay, into the slides. So if you want to purchase real estate without actually being there, you don't have to visit the property. Guess what? Nowadays, we have this thing called the interwebs. You can go ahead and send pictures and video and receive pictures and video via the internet. Uh, you'll need a couple things to do that. We'll discuss that a little later on. So uh, purchasing properties remotely is actually fairly easy. It could be easier than actually buying them in person. So <laughs> that's one reason I do it. So, okay, so when you're never visiting a property, you need pics and video. Like we said, you need to evaluate the area. You can do this online. There's several websites, including Zillow, Realtor.com, the MLS, all kinds of different services that let you evaluate real estate online. You can also go to services like Google and Street View your property and your neighborhood. If you're going to buy a property and you don't bother to do a Google Street View, that's probably going to end up being a problem. You know, you can't really tell from, uh, you know, the other websites how it looks. Uh, but with Google, you can actually get into the street and drive up and down it with your mouse online. So when you do that, you can see if it's a crappy neighborhood, if there's crap laying everywhere, if there's crashed cars, fires, burnt mattresses in the street, you know. You gotta check all that out. Just drive around the neighborhood on Google Street View and you'll uh, be able to see kind of how it is. The other thing you'll need to make sure you have is a really good buyer's agent. We'll go into detail on this in the next slide. And then you wanna be able to contact the seller's realtor somehow. You'll need all of this stuff and you can rely on all this stuff to help you purchase a property remotely. Moving on, we'll tell you what you need to do this. Okay, so there's this fancy thing that they make nowadays called a computer. Uh, you know, I got a buddy that does this uh, whole iPhone course. I don't know if you can really buy a property from an iPhone. You're probably going to need a computer for this. Maybe it'll be something he can put up a video on uh, going through buying a property from your iPhone. Uh, but anyway, so you're going to need a computer. You're going to need some interwebs, uh, you know, like a connection to that so you can search on the Google. Uh, and you're going to need email. Um, so we talked about email a little bit before. You'll be doing a lot of this. So uh, if you're bad at responding or dealing with email or you don't even know your email password at this point, you can probably go ahead and stop watching this video because it's probably not going to work out for you. So in your email, we talked before as well, you're going to want to put your contact info in the signature. It's more professional and allows people to contact you quickly because in this process, things will come up that need to be handled immediately or the loan will not come through and you can't close on the property. Next thing you'll need is a buyer's agent. So finding one of these is actually fairly simple. Uh, you simply Google the city that you want to buy a house in and then put buyer's agent. So, you know, if you want to like Chattanooga, Tennessee, you just go Chattanooga buyer's agents and you'll get a whole list of realtors. 
So you can check them out. A lot of times there's pictures, there's a little uh, blurb on their bio and all that stuff. Uh, you can find one you think would work and go uh, give them a call and go through, uh, I don't know, two, three, four of them till you find one that you like and uh, go ahead and tell him or her you'd like to work with them to purchase a home. They're going to do a lot of stuff for you in this process. So you want to make sure they're in the city that you're purchasing a house in. Somebody's going to have to drive out there to take a look at the house and it's not going to be you. Okay, so the next thing you need is a mortgage broker that can do a loan in that state or locality. So not all mortgage brokers can do loans all over the country. You want to make sure you just Google, like, I don't know, Chattanooga, Tennessee mortgage brokers. A whole list will come up. There's probably a good thousand of them there. So you kind of call around to a couple of them. Tell them who you are. Tell them how, how much money you got. Tell them what kind of loan you want to get. Usually 30-year fixed rate. You're willing to put 20% down. And tell them your credit score. So once they know all that, they can kind of get you a good idea. And then you go ahead and ask one of them for a pre-approval. They'll ask you for a bunch of info, pay stubs, all that, all that junk. And uh, you're going to go ahead and use this uh, email to uh, send it over to them. They'll also give you a site, most likely, that you can upload documents to. If that mortgage broker doesn't have a site that you can upload documents to securely, I might suggest moving on to a mortgage broker that isn't 80 years old. Uh, not that I would discriminate on age against a mortgage broker, but, you know, I don't care. It's not my mortgage broker. It's yours. Um, okay, so a phone. Yeah, so here's the thing, people. So if you're going to go ahead and do this, you need to answer phone calls. I'll take this our next one, availability. But you got to answer some phone calls every now and then when people are calling you. If you're not good at answering the phone, you probably don't want to do this. Uh, you're going to need to be local so you can drive out there and knock on somebody's door uh, because a lot of people use a phone nowadays to use like texting and actually like calling people. So make sure you have access to a good cell phone. Um, availability. You have to be available for this. All right, if you work in a job 12 hours a day, five days a week, where you can't answer or return a phone call, uh, this probably isn't going to be for you either. You should probably have your spouse or somebody without uh, as intense of a job uh, go ahead and watch this video and do this for you. Um, the next thing you need to do is get a contractor. So getting a contractor is pretty easy. It doesn't matter what city you're in. You can just kind of Google uh, general contractors. And there's some sites out there like Andy's List, you know, I don't know, Home Advisor, all that stuff, that'll give you a good list of contractors with ratings and reviews. Contact a couple of them. Make sure they can do general contracting. So if you need, you know, drywall, you need a bathroom, you need plumbing, or you need a roof, maybe they can do all of that. And you just have one contractor that you rely on to handle the job for you. Okay, last but not least, insurance. So when you're purchasing a house remotely, you have to get insurance on the house if you're going to have a mortgage, right? So in order to get insurance on the house, uh, you know, you give them all the facts and features and all that junk about the house. Uh, they're going to tell you, you know, hey, we need somebody's name locally who's your property manager. So think about this. At the initial point when you're getting insurance, they're going to ask you this question. You have to have somebody there locally since you're not local, maybe out of state or across the country or whatever. Uh, so find somebody that you can use for a property manager. You can actually Google property managers. It doesn't have to be a property manager, right? It could be a friend, family member, whatever. They just have to be listed on your insurance as a contact. And then your insurance is going to send them some mail every now and then. It's not a big deal the mail they get it's just i don't know some advertisements and other garbage that you know comes through the mail junk mail basically uh that insurance uh, all the docs for the insurance is actually going to be mailed directly to you wherever you are so there's that uh once you find somebody for that you're good to go with insurance so you can find a property manager and tell them what you're trying to do and you know they'll probably be like hey you know for uh, i don't know 150 bucks you can list us on there we'll give you our phone number a lot of these property managers are kind of independent people. Uh, you find somebody. Just find somebody around that area in that state or close to that state. If you have a property on a state line, usually the insurance company will let you have uh, your property manager in the next state over there, as long as they're close. Okay, so make sure you have all this stuff. Uh, it's great. Um, you know, if you have a crappy computer, you might want to upgrade that before you get into this. Okay. So once you find a house, you're going to have all these inspections that need to be done because you're not going to be there to take pictures of it and feel the walls and, uh, you know, see how squishy the floor is because, uh, you know, the dog's been peeing there for the last 10 years for whoever owns this house now. Uh, so you're going to go ahead and contact a professional inspector. 
Uh, you just Google that for the area. You'll get a couple of uh, ones that pop up there with some ratings. Call around to them, figure out which one can get there pretty quick, see what their schedule's like. And once you have that, you know, when you put in the offer for this property, you're going to know you can get it inspected within, I don't know, it should be inspected within a week. You're going to have about a 14-day inspection period. I recommend putting out there 21. Go ahead and check out uh, Negotiating Real Estate. I might link that video down here or over here or up here, wherever uh, the old YouTube decides to link stuff. So you contact that inspector. They're going to go out there and inspect the property. They're going to give you a big old list of all the stuff that's wrong with it. And you're going to go from there. So then you can also have your realtor go out there before, after, during, whatever the inspection, as long as your realtor agrees to that. They should. Uh, after all, they're pretty much, you're doing all the work for them. Um, they're just going to go out there and take some pictures, talk to this inspector, uh, or give you their opinion on some stuff that needs to be changed. You know, what, one thing realtors are real good at is checking out a house and letting you know where the problem areas are and then giving you an opinion on what a tenant's going to think needs to be changed. My realtor does that really well, and it's one reason I chose them. So then you're going to have your contractor. So if you found a contractor, after your inspector goes through, schedule that contractor for the next day, right? So you got this guy scheduled for like, I don't know, you know, like uh, five days out. Schedule this contractor to go out there six days out to estimate repairs. He's going to come back to you, this pro inspector. Say, hey, it needs a new furnace, needs a new uh, roof, needs a new gutter, needs, uh, I don't know, you know, you know, a big hole in the yard where they, or their uh, dog that peed all over the floors was digging. Uh, you need to fill that in. So he's going to give you this big old long report, and your contractor is going to go out there, and that next day he can estimate the repairs. So you're all in uh, within your inspection period here. So if that contractor comes back and says, hey, you know, uh, they found all this stuff. It's going to be like, I don't know, $30,000 to repair all that. You can go ahead and put that in your inspection addendum that, hey, you need all this repaired. And then you have another week for them to accept that. Again, watch our uh, negotiating real estate uh, video. And it kind of covers all this stuff um, and gives you some uh, tips and tricks on how to deal with that and negotiate the price at this point. So yeah, you're going to have that good estimate. You're going to know how much it's going to cost you to fix up this house so that a renter can move in. This contractor is also going to give you a time frame. You know, they may say it's going to take two weeks. Uh, we got another video on this on dealing with uh, contractors. Um, so, but anyway, the point of that video is I'll just save you watching it, um, is that uh, whatever this contractor tells you, go ahead and add two weeks to that. So if he says or she says it's going to be two weeks, um, go ahead and add, uh, you know, make that four weeks because that's that's just how contractors are. Uh, again, if you find one that uh, actually finishes jobs on time, uh, go ahead and link their contact info in the comments. I'll go ahead and switch right over to them. All right, next slide. So you've gone through this whole process. You had some emails back and forth. You've sent the docs over, uh, you know, initial stuff here. See, the, the fancy thing about being in uh, the, you know, the world today, um, we'll go back to this other slide here. So like we talked about, uh, we said you're going to need this. Uh, if you have one of these things, um, all the way up to closing, people are just emailing you stuff to e-sign, right? So you just log in, e-sign it, and you're done. You usually do this during the day, anytime. You can do it from your phone. I recommend doing it on a computer so you can actually read the documents. A lot of the stuff you don't really need to read. It's just a bunch of crap from your uh, realtor. Uh, I mean, uh, valuable documents from your realtor explaining that, you know, they represent you and all this other stuff. You just go ahead and sign off on those. Um, and then, uh, you know, like I said, not financial advice. I definitely recommend reading and I definitely read everything that I sign. But you're going to get a bunch of this stuff. And on your computer, you just log in and e-sign. It might be kind of difficult on your phone because a lot of these uh, e-sign programs are kind of crappy and don't work on a cellular phone. So, yeah, you're going to go ahead and do all that. And we'll go back to this other slide here, the closing slide. So when you get close to closing, you've had all this other stuff come through, e-signed and all that. You've uploaded a bunch of pay stubs and everything. So you're not actually, like, delivering physical documents up to this point. It's all online, right? So you don't actually have to be there to sign or do anything. Other people will do this stuff. Sure, it might cost you like $100 to get a contractor out there to kind of check it out after the uh, inspector goes through, but that contractor should do a free estimate anyway. If they're going to go out there, they're going to say, oh, blah, 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 this is wrong, this is wrong. So you've done everything remotely. And when closing comes around, within three days, you want to make sure you're available all the time. 
So if somebody calls you and you're at work, you have to answer it. If you don't have the ability to answer a call while you're at work, this is gonna be a problem. All kinds of stuff is gonna come up in the last three days. You know, a little story here. Uh, one house I purchased, the uh, title agency was going back and forth with my mortgage broker over and over and over again. So they're sending all these documents back and forth, trying to figure out how much you owe at closing, how much the seller owes at closing, what the total closing you know costs are going to be, what the price of the house is. And they, they were going back and forth for, you know, I don't know, a good uh, week before closing and none of their numbers matched up. So I had to get involved and straighten it out with them. I literally had to call these people, the title agent and my mortgage broker, and be like, hey, can you guys uh, put your heads together on this one and make your numbers match up? Because I kind of have to e-sign this form within three days of closing so the seller can have documents to review. So they went ahead and did that. But point is, I was available to call them and do this. If I wasn't, that uh, closing either would have been pushed back because the docs weren't done, or it just would never have happened because the seller would have backed out. And I may have lost my earnest money because these two parties couldn't get their uh, ducks in a row. Quack. So yeah, there you go. So with the docs, okay, almost everything is e-signed. All right, 95% of what you're going to sign is all electronic. So there's some other stuff you have to actually physically sign, and there's some stuff you have to actually get notarized. So what's going to happen, that title agent is going to go ahead and email you over all of these documents. Maybe I should have put, you need a printer for this too, but honestly, there's what, you don't even need a printer. Heck, it's uh, cheaper. You don't have to use your own toner if you just, like, you know, call up your bank and be like, hey, I got a mortgage to sign. Can I go ahead and uh, fax that over to you? And they say yes. So then they get to print up 80 pages uh, instead of you. So anyway, that's going to get emailed over to you. If you don't have a fax machine or an e-fax, there's this thing called an e-fax nowadays, go ahead and sign up for one of those. You can fax all those mortgage docs over to the bank and it'll just print up on their fax machine. Uh, but also your title agent can fax it over to the bank. You just give them the phone number over there for the fax machine. Then you'll show up at the bank and boom, all of your documents are there. So it's going to be a stack of papers, like, I don't know, 60 to 120 pages, depending uh, how, how in-depth this mortgage is. And you're going to have to go ahead and sign a bunch of stuff, probably 20 to 30 signatures on all these papers, and maybe five or six of them are going to have to be notarized. So if you've never done it before, notaries are pretty common. If you have a good relationship with your bank, you just, hey, call them up over there and be like, hey, y'all, uh, Mr. Branch Manager, what are, how y'all doing today? Yeah, I haven't been in there in a while, you know. Um, uh, can uh, y'all got any um, notaries there today? And that branch manager will probably say, yeah, we have two of them here. Come on in. So you're going to go on in there and they're going to be like, hey, we got this whole stack of papers that spit out of our fax machine for you. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I need those notarized. Thank you so much, Mr. or Mrs. Branch Manager. And you're going to go ahead and take that notary uh, and sign off all these uh, papers that need to be notarized. So the other thing that title agent's going to do is email you a uh, overnight um, label for, you know, like, I don't know, U UPS, FedEx, or uh, USPS. So you're going to have to be available that day to go ahead and throw those documents in an envelope at the post office and slap that overnight label on all of your notarized documents. You send that back to them and boom, you have yourself a house. What ends up happening, uh, in all honesty, like they get the docs, uh, the seller, if the seller wants to, comes in for the closing. Seller doesn't really have to either. It's just, you know, if they don't, they got to kind of wait for their check or whatever. Um, so, you know, the Keller, the, the seller will go into the closing. All these docs that you send in will be notarized and signed and you have to wire some money, right? So, uh, you know, if we bought a house for $115,000, you're going to have to wire them probably if you, uh, did the negotiating correctly. Again, watch our video on negotiating real estate might be uh, posted up here in the middle or down here somewhere. Um, if you negotiated properly, hopefully you're just sending 20% or less of the purchase price of that house. So, you know, we had an example uh, in that previous video of a $115,000 house. If you negotiate properly, hopefully you're only wiring twenty or $30,000 over there. It'd be $30,000 on a $115,000 property at 20%. And that's it. Uh, it could actually could be less than that if your closing costs are less than 2%. I've purchased homes before where my closing cost was less than 2%, and I ended up paying a total out-of-pocket less than 20% for the house. 
So anyway, that money gets wired over to the title agency. They'll give you all that info. Once that money gets there, it can be done same day, day before, whatever. It's just got to be done probably, you know, I'd recommend before noon. So they have plenty of time to actually receive the money and close the deal. So yeah, then, then you have yourself a house, but you know, uh, there's another slide here because what do you do after the closing? Like you're, uh, you know, let's say a thousand miles away and you have your realtor over there hanging on to some keys. He like maybe text you a picture of your new keys. Uh, so, you know, what do you do at that point? All right, next slide. Okay, and what do you know after closing? First thing on the list is the keys. So, you know, eventually somebody's going to have to get into your house uh, to either rent it or show it. Uh, it's typical in the industry for your realtor to collect the keys and hand them to you or to be at the closing with you. Since we're not at the closing, we're not really asking our realtor to do anything extra by having them show up at the closing and grab the keys. So that realtor is going to go ahead and grab the keys. Uh, you know, they just made an easy 2 or 3% on this house because all they did was drive over there. You did a lot of the negotiating because you watched our other video and maybe other uh, other stuff, uh, instructions on how to negotiate. You know, again, uh, if you're not comfortable negotiating, probably want to do that yourself. I just happen to negotiate all day long uh, in my real job and just kind of do real estate negotiation as a hobby, which is, uh, you know, uh, it's a lot of fun for me because it's a hobby, and I'm, you know, uh, and I make money off of it. So I guess you could say it's a job. I don't know. I just like it. So I don't want to call it a job. Okay, so your realtor has the keys. He can go ahead and or she can go ahead and put a lockbox on your door uh, to this new house and put the keys in it. I would recommend talking to that realtor and going with a buyer's agent that's willing to show your house to a tenant afterward. I pay my realtor one half month's rent and any extra cash left over after the purchase of the home uh, after I hit my number on the house uh, so that they can show the house and get it rented to a tenant. Now, all they're doing is showing the house. They're not really able to do credit checks and all that stuff. Why would they? You want to make sure it's a tenant that's going to work for you. So that realtor is going to go over there and uh, put those keys in a lockbox so that they can get in and your contractor can get in. So you've talked to this contractor, you know, you've had them on uh, the horn there for the last two or three weeks since they uh, went by the property after the inspection. So that contractor is expecting to start work the day of or day after closing. So if you can get them to do that, you'll be turning that house around for a tenant a lot faster. So as far as a tenant goes, what you're going to do as soon as you close, uh, if you haven't negotiated pre-advertising the home with the seller, as soon as you close, you're going to go ahead and uh, put in your info on whatever site you want to advertise that on. Make sure you uh, that site shows that you possess that property. Then you're going to put it up for rent uh, for whatever amount, as long as the property is showable. If you don't have any good pictures, no point putting up for rent. Have that contractor go out there and fix some stuff up so that it looks uh, rentable in pictures. Your realtor will then send you pictures of the property or that contractor will, and you post them online to get a tenant. So you're going to end up getting like, I don't know, five, six, seven calls if it's a uh, decently priced rental. I don't recommend pricing them too high. You want to kind of go within uh, with what's in the market. But you're also paying attention to that 1% rent to value ratio. Why are you buying a house if you're only getting a half percent rent to value ratio? What are you thinking? You're not making any money. Nobody's making any money on this deal. So anyway, the contractor can get in. Now, now you have tenants coming over. Your realtor is going to show them through. Uh, I schedule all my tenants and kind of text my realtor when they'll be there. Um, and that realtor shows up and the tenants show up and uh, they kind of show them through the house there. So then the realtor gives me a report afterward. And then we go ahead and do a leasing process with the tenant. That'll be another video, leasing properties remotely. Maybe it'll show up right here at the end of this. I don't know. Hang on. Um, okay, so that's pretty much it. That's how you uh, do a house, um, get get a house without ever visiting it. It's pretty easy. Uh, you know, it's not for everybody. It can kind of give you the willies not being there. Uh, but you know what I say? Uh, why do I care to take a look in person at the house when I'm not living in it? It doesn't really matter what I think. It matters what a tenant thinks. Okay, here we go. Next slide. So that'll do it for buying real estate remotely. It's super easy. There's other stuff, obviously, that you can come up against, but that gives you a good example of how you can do it. 
Um, feel free to link in the comments or post in the comments below anything you feel I missed or anything you want me to go into more in depth on in another video. Should be a little subscribe thing here. Should be a little uh, another video to watch over here. Oops, I just clicked there and drew on my slide. That's okay. Um, and then you should have a little thumb it's down here below this cache. You know, you hit the thumb up. That gets thumb up for money right there. Uh, okay, well, hey, till next time, everybody. Y'all take her easy out there.